Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. Hosea 2, 1 through 23. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Plead for your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. Let I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I have no mercy because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore and she conceived them as <clears throat> has acted, excuse me, she who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge upon her, uh, hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall, shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but not, shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was her I gave, I who gave her, the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished her, lavished on her silver and gold, which they use for ba bail. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time, and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end uh, to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour, th devour them. And I will punish her for the feast of, day, of the days of ba Baals. When she burned offering to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of anchor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. <clears throat> For I will remove the names of Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name <clears throat> no more. And I will make for them a covenant on the day with the beasts of the fields, and the birds of the heaven, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and I shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grains, and the wine, and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow for her myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. A few weeks back, news broke. Secret sin became public sin. The news that a prominent and respected preacher in Dallas had been removed from leadership in his church due to a quote-unquote inappropriate relationship with a woman that was not his wife. You know, this is not the first time this has happened, uh, and if the Lord should tarry, this will happen again. Yet, nonetheless, it is a, a hard reality. A few weeks prior to that news becoming public, I was informed that another pastor, this particular pastor being a friend of mine, had also been removed from his leadership. 
for failing to be a one-woman man as required in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. We live in a world fraught with infidelity and public scandal, but there's something different and unique for me, particularly as a pastor, when the guilty one is a fellow pastor, whether I know them only by reputation or whether I know them personally, these particular instances are difficult. Uh, These two men made vows to their wives and their churches, and now their secret sins have been made public and a flood of consequences is rushing upon them. Now, it can be an incredibly uncomfortable thing to even talk about this stuff in public. Um, and it's an incredibly uncomfortable thing to be present or informed of a person's guilt as they are receiving the discipline due for their actions. Just being around the situation, just interacting with it is awkward, even though we're not the guilty ones or we're not in trouble or, or whatever the case may be. Just hearing about it is difficult. It's hard. It's awkward. Now, whether we're talking about preachers in the news or whether it's your little brother being corrected for a failure to obey, any big siblings in here, any siblings, any brothers or sisters, is it awkward to watch your sibling get corrected, to be in trouble? It's awkward, right? Some of us, maybe very recently, have been within earshot when a co-worker got an earful for being late, or... Many of us have experienced the difficulty of a fellow church member being announced for church discipline and hearing that person's sins being made public. This is awkward. This is unpleasant. These are instances where we want to kind of blend into the background and disappear, and and we can think of a lot of other places we would rather be. While it may not be an enjoyable experience, And we might not enjoy a home or a society or a church in which we hear the ugly realities of other people's sin. It is actually part of God's wise counsel and part of his care for us that we endure the discomfort of witnessing the punishment and correction of other people. God gives us the sweet gift of learning from our own mistakes. Amen? Anybody learn from their own mistakes? God giving you that good gift? Not only does he give us the gift of learning from our mistakes, but he also uses the failures of others to help us walk in the light as he is in the light. When we become informed of another person's sin being found out, every one of us should feel a jolt. Pride will lead us to think we're somehow incapable of the grievous sins that other people commit. But humility, the Spirit of Christ, will lead us to seek the Lord, lest we likewise fall. The book of Hosea is a publication of the sins of the nation of Israel and the sins of Hosea's unfaithful wife, Gomer. God called Hosea to marry an adulterous woman as a sign and display of Hosea's, of Israel's treachery toward their covenant God. God sent Hosea, I want you to take this woman and I want you to marry her. She will be unfaithful to you and she will spurn your love and loyalty. Do this, Hosea. Why? Because it will be a sign, it will be a living illustration to the people of Israel of how they are living with me. God, as covenant Lord of his people Israel, has been faithful and loyal But Israel has been unfaithful. This is not simply idolatry. This is spiritual adultery. Part of Yahweh's work to lead his people to repentance and restoration was to show them that that their worship of idols was no better than a selfish woman seeking out her, seeking, stepping out on her hard working and devoted husband. Being guilty of idolatry is one thing, but seeing it in the light of the truth of it being like skipping out on your husband is another thing altogether. Though this book is an awkward confrontation of those caught in sin, we must receive it as God's word 
And we would be wise to pay attention so that we might avoid the sins that caused such trouble. The strong language in our passage may be hard to hear, but let it be clear to us all that God's use of strong language is always perfect. Right? Hopefully you've got the very basic principle. Children, very basic principle. If God does something, he does it perfectly. And so if God uses strong and, and disquieting language, he does it perfectly and without error. So when God uses this strong language and these shocking images and in intense tone, you and I would do well to assume that these things are necessary. Why? Due to the stubborn disobedience of the audience. Does God always speak with such shocking language? Does God always speak with such intense tone? No. But he does it when the, the setting is appropriate. And who God is speaking to in the book of Hosea is a deeply stubborn, hard-hearted, calloused people who weren't going to hear the quiet, soft voice. They weren't going to hear the sweet lullaby. They needed to be shocked. And that's why the Lord uses such shock, shocking language in the book of Hosea. This morning, as we work our way through the verse, first 13 verses of Hosea 2, uh, and seek a better understanding of God's word, it is my goal to make one main idea clear and compelling to each of us. It's not my aim to explain every line and every word, but it is my aim to make these first 13 verses make one particular thing press in on you. Okay, The main idea that I want to make clear and compelling this morning is, is, is simple. It's only a few words, but the main idea is this. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. I believe that it's something very clear being taught from this passage, and so it is my hope as a servant of the Scriptures to make that point clear to you. I hope that you walk out of this room utterly convinced by the Word of God that the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Now this will become evident as we go along, but from the outset, I want to make a distinction between discipline and judgment. Okay? When I say the Lord disciplines the one he loves, I want to distinguish that from saying that God judges the one he loves. Okay? Sometimes people get discipline and judgment confused or discipline and condemnation confused. And I want to try to distinguish these two briefly before we get too many pieces flying around. Okay, so extend an introduction here before we get to point number one. I want it to be clear that you understand that the Lord disciplines the one he loves, but I don't want you to be confused with thinking that God judges the one he loves. Okay? Our church doctrinal statement says this particularly about the judgment of God. God has appointed a day wherein he will judge the world by Jesus Christ, when everyone shall receive according to his deeds. The wicked shall go into everlasting punishment, the righteous into everlasting life. What this statement is communicating is that at the final judgment, God will bless those who embrace Jesus through faith, and he will condemn those who have rejected Jesus. That's judgment. That's something I want you to understand but I don't want you to confuse that with what I'm talking about this morning with discipline. Though this final judgment awaits a singular moment yet to come, God is not inactive towards sin and good deeds now. Right? I want you to understand that God has established and set and ordained a day in which he will deal fully and finally with sin and good deeds. But that does not mean that God is somehow passive in his role and interaction with sin and good deeds today. For the Christian, this means that God may bless your efforts and prayers soon. God doesn't push all of his rewards off until the final judgment. God may hear your prayer today and bless you. God may do good and gracious things to you now, even before we, we get to the judgment. But many of your prayers, many of your blessings will be held until the final 
judgment. There will be a day when all of the blessings and rewards that God's promised but doesn't give in this life will come at that time. Now, it also means that though your sins are forgiven and you experience no condemnation in Christ, God still disciplines, corrects, and purifies you through various trials before you enjoy your full glorification yet to come. And this is the particular thing I'm most concerned of being unclear or confusing to some of you. It's true that even now, if you have faith in Christ, if you are a baptized believer, there's no condemnation. You're fully forgiven, you're fully accepted in Christ, and this is a glorious thing. And yet, on a daily basis, what do we do? We struggle with sin, don't we? And so, though God holds no judgment or condemnation towards those who are in Christ, he still responds to our indwelling sin with what? With discipline, with correction, with direction, with purification. This correction and purification has a, has a shelf life. One day God will glorify us and he won't have any reason to discipline us anymore. But that day is not today. At least not so far, right? Now, I wanted to make it this, this, this distinction because some of us think if dad gets mad at me, dad's going to throw me out. Okay? If mommy corrects my work, that means I'm leaving, I'm no longer a part of the family. And we jump quickly from correction to condemnation. And I want to put a wall between the two and say that Christian, you are loved and accepted by God. Jesus Christ earned that for you. And your indwelling sin is going to be corrected by a loving Father. Okay? Now, hopefully those two things are working together. This can be tricky. This distinction can be tricky, and people can sometimes worry that God disciplines them, and that's a hard thing to think through, but I, I want to lay it out so that we don't get confused. If this issue is still unclear when we finish here this morning, please grab me and say, Drew, you failed. I don't get it. Okay, let's talk about this. I want you to understand this, but it's clear that God loves us, and one of the ways he loves his adopted children is he corrects them. He disciplines them. Okay, now... What is the main point again? The main point is that the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And we're going to take three separate chunks, three separate emphases to make this main point clear. Okay, First point is this. God rebukes his beloved. God restrains his beloved. And God repossesses from his beloved. Okay, So I want you to understand the main point. God's going to discipline those he loves. In distinct ways he does this, the distinct ways he disciplines is through rebuke, restraint, and repossession. All right, let's look first, verses 1 through 5, and how God rebukes his beloved. Friends, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open. I really want to be faithful to communicate the God of the Scriptures and not the God of my imagination. And I want you to believe in the God of the Scriptures and not the God of some preacher's imagination. So keep your Bibles open, look and see how, what I say and whether or not it lines up with the text. Okay? While chapter 1 was primarily about Hosea and his messy family, here in chapter 2, God is using these illustrations of the messy family to engage the northern kingdom of Israel. Chapter 1 is largely speaking words to Hosea. Chapter 2 is largely words spoken through Hosea to Israel. In verses 1 through 5, God is coordinating through the prophet and a sort of group intervention. He's coordinating with Hosea. He's coordinating with Hosea to grab these brothers and sisters and to do a group intervention in Israel. The children in this chapter seem to best coordinate with the faithful or the undecided in Israel, while the mother in this passage 
seems to best represent the rulers or the leaders, those in positions of authority in the nation. The nation has led, the leaders have led the nation into idolatry and adultery, and the children have simply followed their leaders. And so Hosea is calling to the brothers and sisters, he's calling to the children, hey, those of you under the leadership uh, who has led us into idolatry, cry out to her. Let's engage, let's intervene in what is happening here in our nation. Hosea seeks teammates in verse 1, and then shares his message in verse 2 and following. He charges his hearers to, quote, plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. This pleading is urgent and serious. It's direct and acts like a lawsuit that cannot be shrugged off without consequence. Plead with your mother. Plead with her. Like Hosea's marriage that was destroyed by Gomer's infidelity, so Israel's idols have ruined the covenant of loyal love with Yahweh. The wayward and whoring people are now the target of God's gracious pursuit. As Hosea and anyone with him are urged to call Israel to put away her cruel double dipping. This rebuke and pleading, this call to repent is done with a clear warning that mercy will come to an end and when it does, pain and death will surely follow according to verses 3 and 4. Verse 5 then lists the crimes that have earned this rebuke as we read that Israel, like a terrible wife, has acted shamefully and chased after others to meet her wants and needs. Though our initial processing of this opening section and all the strong language about gross sin and capital punishment may make our heads spin, I want you to see the awesome display of God's mercy and his extravagant grace Towards sinners. Israel's trashed him. This interaction, this, these people that God is speaking to, this is holy and righteous God speaking to a people who have been awful toward him. They have been disgustingly awful and selfish toward him. And God is engaging them. He has lavished good things upon them. He's made them wealthy and safe. But instead of loving him and treasuring him and moving closer to him, they have repeatedly chosen to knock on other doors in search of something else. God has promised his unfailing love, but they've resisted the call to love and trust him alone. Instead of simply cutting them loose, God initiates conflict with them with the aim of repairing what has been broken. Okay. We could look at this, and I want to try to, this is one of the most difficult things I think about these opening chapters of Hosea, is that you're, you're balancing a very relational marriage that's been blown up by wicked selfishness, and you're balancing that with a nation that is bowing down to idols. Right? I don't want to get too far to one way or the other, but I want you to feel the emotional ick that as God moves toward Israel, calling them to repent and to turn to him, this is like a husband going to a woman who has slept with every man in the apartment complex. Have you seen my wife? Have you seen her? I'm looking for her. I'm trying to find my wife. This is disgusting what Israel has done. We shouldn't look at idolatry and think that is a sin, that is a breaking of a law. We should look at that, believing those things to be true, that this is sin, this is disobedience towards God, but it is relationally disgusting. This is gross. 
can we get out of this room? Can we change the page? Can we change the topic? I don't want to be here. But listen, instead of God just saying, fire and brimstone, move on. Flood 2.0, let's do this. Instead of God just ending them, what does he do? He initiates conflict with them. He initiates a lawsuit. He sends a judge. He sends a prophet. He sends a lawyer to call them back so that we can see if we can repair this broken relationship. Okay? I want you to see the mercy of God. You and I live in a time when it is especially easy to cut people off without direct engagement. What do you do when you get an email from a source you don't want to receive emails from? Unsubscribe. Done. Over. You and I live in a particularly easy time to cut people off. We even have this verb of ghosting for such events. If someone makes us angry, one click, we unfriend them on social media. Someone sends us a text or calls us and we don't want to engage with them, what do we do? Just block their number. It's almost as if it never happened. In a world of simply ignoring people we don't get along with, we might think a direct confrontation like this is incredibly cruel. How could God just like get in their face about that? But I submit to you that ghosting people is far worse than direct confrontation. This may strike you as bizarre that I would say this, but I think simply deleting someone's text message and unfriending them is more cruel than directly interacting with them in your disagreement. Hear me. Ghosting is selfish. It's unfair, and it's cowardly. It silently expresses disdain, rejection, and an unwillingness to even try to understand or make repairs. Though confrontation and a call to repentance may be scary and uncomfortable, it is personally sacrificial. It takes sacrifice to engage with somebody you've had a disagreement with. Somebody you've butted heads with, it requires sacrifice. And someone who ghosts or unsubscribes or deletes a friendship says, I don't want to do that. Cut it off. Direct confrontation is fair. It recognizes that there's two parties in this disagreement and not just one. It's fair and it's also courageous. It clearly communicates that the other person in a broken or strained relationship is valuable and desired. When you ghost somebody, you're saying, you aren't even worth trying to figure this out. But when we say, hey, I want to work this out. I want to have a really hard conversation with you. You are courageously and sacrificially making the statement that the other person is worth something. And that I care enough to pursue this relationship. Friends, I need you to see this truth about God and cling to it. God rebukes the one he loves. This, this should come as a great relief to many of us. Listen, God's love doesn't ghost his children. <laughs> Maybe you've not thought about it in these terms before, but you ever been afraid that, is God ghosting me? Did he somehow unsubscribe from my prayers? Did he lose my number? Maybe that's not the way you're thinking about it. But hear me, this direct confrontation, this initiating conflict with Israel proves to you that God doesn't ghost, that God's love makes your life more uncomfortable than simply having a silent end. 
God's love doesn't ghost his children and it doesn't let them do whatever they want. In Romans 1, we are told of people who hate and refuse God and that God expresses his judgment upon them by ending his efforts to correct them. Now, does God's confrontation always happen all the time and without end? No, it doesn't. There are, is a time when God does something like ghosting, and we read about that in Romans 1. We read there that God's response to people who hated him and refused him is an act of judgment in which God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the Creator rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, Romans says, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged the natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise, likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Romans 1 says that God gave these people up as an act of judgment. He, he ended his mercy, he ended his um, love and compassion towards them, and he let them go. He let them pursue their corrupt desires into deplorable and unconscionable things that are contrary to nature. God does hand people over. But contrary to this, God corrects, God rebukes the ones he loves. Friends, having an inner peace about your life might be the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Ever heard anybody say, yeah, I'm living with my boyfriend and I know the Bible says that that's not the way it's supposed to be done, but I have just a peace about it. I submit to you, the way to interpret that is according to Romans 1 and that God has handed you over and he's not even fighting with you anymore. You've refused him so many times that his mercy has ended and he's letting you do what you want to do. Scripture tells us that God rebukes sinners that he loves and that he lets those who are under his wrath do whatever they want. That inner peace that you have with sin may be the beginnings of hell and the judgment of God. If God is not in conflict with you, it's not a good thing. Christian, you might feel like God doesn't love you because you carry with you a constant sense that you need God's mercy and forgiveness. You wake up every morning aware that you are a sinner and you feel like God is angry with you because you have this constant sense that you need God and that you have offended him and that you never do anything quite right. You might regularly feel like God is correcting you, but what I want to get across is that God's heart in his correction is love. When you and I get it straight that his love corrects us, we can find sweet relief in knowing that his rebukes prove his commitment and affection. How do I know I'm not under God's judgment right now? Because I feel like he's correcting me. Every day I feel God's correction. How do I know that I'm not under God's judgment? Because he keeps speaking to me and he keeps leading me to repentance. When you feel God's care in his confrontation, we are then powerfully motivated to put off sin and put on godliness. This is the recipe for a life of deeper joy and fellowship with God. Hear me, you need to understand that God corrects the one he loves. Because when you feel corrected and you know that this is love, hey, I'm ready to do it a different way. 
God is correcting me. He's helping me. He's loving me. Wow, I feel so loved by God because I feel like I need him constantly. This is God's love for us and not his judgment. Please hear me. When an imperfect person is adopted by a perfect God, there will be lots of loving correction. Right? It makes mathematical sense. We're like, oh, duh. Right? But we, that's not our natural response in correction in seasons of difficulty, is it? But if an imperfect person like you, like me, is adopted by a perfect father, what do you think is going to happen? He's going to help us. He's going to correct us. He's going to shape us. He's going to wash us. He's going to show us a new way of doing things. And what a glorious thing it is that God's love corrects his children. Now, a verbal rebuke wasn't enough for Israel during the ministry of the prophet Hosea, but God's love is much greater than a rebuke. And we'll see that here in point number two. Point number two is that God not only rebukes, but God restrains his beloved. In verses 6 through 8, the Lord says that his compassionate correction will go farther than rebuke and that he will personally foil and frustrate her attempts to find rest and reward in her sinful plans. We read this, Therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She will pursue her lovers but not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. God worked against his people's efforts because their aims were twisted and flawed. God was an opponent. God was in opposition to them because their aims and goals were flawed. Our passage goes on to say that the result of this frustration will cause adulterous Israel to say this, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. We see that Israel wrongly thought that her provisions, all her good things that she was enjoying in life, her pleasures, she thought they came from somewhere other than God. She thought that someone else provided them and not Yahweh, and that her pragmatic and selfish pursuit of comfort ended up making her a slave to the highest bidder. Her love for results, her love for wealth and comfort, her desire to use her own efforts, made her a slave to whichever God was going to give her what she wanted. She became a slave to the highest bidder. Instead of a beloved bride receiving all her good things from her husband, she submitted herself to slavery. She failed to see how it was God who provided for her, and so she turned her back on him to pursue her love of wealth. Israel's sinful love of wealth and her fear of discomfort led her to mistrust God and to pursue her wants from sinful idolatry. But God graciously let the air out of her tires so she couldn't do what she had planned. God filled her days with difficulty, pain, and frustration so that she would change course and look to him alone who could provide what she needed and longed for. Let me say that again because this is not something you're going to read on a coffee mug. right? God filled her days with difficulty, pain, and frustration. Why? Why? so that she would change course and look to him who alone could provide what she needed and longed for. Unlike popular definitions of love, God's care for his beloved will make things harder so that she finds the right path. Our world will call God's work here abusive and manipulative. But such judgments require a belief that human beings are as free and wise as God. I understand that what I'm reading here of God hedging in a people's way and correcting them and frustrating them, many people will look at that and say, that's the, 
the actions of an abuser. That's the actions of a manipulator. But for us to say that God is being abusive and manipulative requires us to believe that we are as wise and good as God. Rough shoves and abrupt pulls might usually be cruel. They might usually be the calling cards of manipulation and abuse. But if a blind man is being directed through a razor wire maze, those not-so-gentle actions are an incredible blessing. Human pride denies our blindness and our need of divine wisdom to guide us. We think we simply need a little encouragement now and then, but God knows we need trials of various kinds to steer us out of great danger. Friends, you and I are the blind man in a razor wire maze. God isn't going to just sit back and let you navigate. There are times he puts his hands on us and it feels rough. But if you are blind, if you are blind and you trust God, you will say, oh Lord, put your rough hands on me and keep me from danger. Keep me from danger. But this is not the spirit of the age. This is not the way we view God. This is not the way we view ourselves. But thanks be to God, this is what the Spirit is leading us and has led us to believe in part. This is a hard concept to get, but consider the cross of Jesus. If we remove the cross of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection for sinners like you and me, we lose Christianity. But consider the cross. If our sinful guilt puts us in such a doomed position... That the eternal son had to take on a human nature so that he could endure God's appropriate and necessary wrath on the cross to secure our salvation. Don't you think that the continued presence of sin in our lives might need some strong medicine? God is going to save sinners. And his response is Jesus Christ taking on flesh and going to the cross. That seems like a strong response, don't you think? That seems like an awful lot of work to deal with sin. Now consider, if you and I still have indwelling sin in our redeemed bodies, right? We're redeemed, we're forgiven, and if we still have sin in our lives, don't you think God's going to respond with strong medicine? Saints, Jesus endured horrific suffering to save you. And he graciously uses frustrations and difficulties to draw you closer to himself and away from the suicidal foolishness that still indwells our fallen hearts. If Jesus went went to the cross to deal with my sin, my continued struggles with sin still need a strong Savior willing to make great sacrifices, great hardships and troubles and difficulties And confrontation are what's needed and necessary to keep you and me as as Christians from falling into greater sin. Romans 5 tells us that we've been justified. Amen? What a good and glorious thing. We've been justified. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Is that the end of Romans? No. It goes on to say... That because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, we can then rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Church, if God loves us, he won't allow us to have easy lives on the lazy river of ignorant and dangerous desires. If God loves us, he won't allow us to have easy lives. If he loves us, he will inject frustration and failure and disruption and delay into our lives. If God loves you, your life will be hard. If God loves you, your life will be hard. 
Yahweh's love for Israel led him to rebuke and restrain his people as their foolish desires led them after other gods. And we find this same love at work in the church. God's love is tough medicine. We need it, don't we? And when it needs to be, and as we will see in this next point, God's tough medicine of rebuke and of restraint, God will also not give up on his people and go so far as to repossess blessings from them. We see this point number three, God repossesses from his beloved. Sometimes a rebuke isn't enough, and sometimes even restraint isn't enough. In such stubborn cases, God's never-ending glorious love still has options before he ends his rescue efforts. Verses 9 through 13 describe how he will, quote-unquote, take back his grain, his wine, his wool, and his flax that has met his people's need. God is telling Israel he's going to be the repo man. What he's given, he's going to take away. You've taken my blessings and you've given it to idols and you've used my blessings to praise idols. And if you don't respond, I'm going to take these things back. God's care will expose his people's hidden yet shameful sin. He will end her parties and her hypocritical religion. The fruit of her labors will be destroyed and add to her trouble. And then verse 13 tells us that God will punish Israel's idolatry because her sin was a selfish abandonment of her devoted and loving Lord. Though God has been abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, Israel got nervous. She started looking for other things to rely on. God has been faithful and good, but she wanted something more, something else. She wanted other gods. She wanted more promises. She wanted more than what God gave her. But listen, God never failed to provide for Israel. Though he never failed them, Israel spurned his affection by cozying up to sin and self-reliance. And in response, God rightly begins to repossess the blessings he had given because she believed his goodness came to her by her hard work with other lovers. Now, it's hard to watch God inflict this painful discipline on his wayward people, isn't it? It's hard to watch it. It's hard to look at it. There's this sense in us where we just don't want to see Israel get in trouble But I want you to see that it's a massive help to you and me. It's hard to watch somebody else get in trouble, but it's a huge help to us. In much the same way as the news of a pastor's secret sin being exposed shocks us into sobriety, so also Israel's discipline helps us see that God's love will pursue our repentance all the way to firing, excommunication, and even devastating loss. We look at a pastor get fired, we look at a pastor get exposed, we look at people getting in trouble, we, we endure a friend being excommunicated or a whole host of other devastating losses that fall upon people. It can be hard and, and, and difficult to watch. But listen, if God disciplines the one he, he loves, all of these responses are proof that God's love is not weak God's love is not fickle. God's love is not short-lived. God is going to pursue people longer than we even understand. God pursues a wayward wife longer than any man ever pursued his own wayward wife. God's love refuses to let even the sneakiest sinner to simply slip through his fingers. Hear me. I hate That this friend of mine has lost his job because of his secret sin has been exposed. It's awkward. I hate it. I don't like thinking about this other pastor having an extended inappropriate relationship. I don't like that it's become public. And there are a lot of things to think about. And there are many things hanging in the balance. But what I can't 
forget, and what Hosea teaches us, is that the exposed pastor is experiencing the love of God. God didn't just let them live in secret sin their entire life and then be exposed to the fires of hell. God confronted them. God exposed them. God is lovingly bringing great difficulties upon them in their sin. But it is clear that God won't let the sneakiest sinner simply slip through the cracks. God will rebuke. God, in his love, will resist. And when it is time, he will repossess the blessings that were being abused. God does this not from spite or hateful disgust, but from affectionate desire to see the relationship restored. Now, like me, I assume you're going to need some time to meditate and think on that. That God would discipline and expose a man caught in great sin. That God would bring great devastation on a person's life because of his affection for them. God does not give up on people quickly. He disciplines. He loves, and in his love he disciplines with correction. In the book of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit is working to help a discouraged people, a people who are being tempted by a variety of things. And in Hebrews 12, the author says this. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Have you forgotten what the scriptures say in a fatherly voice to his beloved children? Have you forgotten? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. Brother, sister, God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're an illegitimate child and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Saints, we have and will endure many trials and difficulties. We will face moments and even decades of painful and unpleasant circumstances that will feel like the furthest thing from the loving compassion of the Lord. But if we trust his word, we can have the peaceful assurance that he is disciplining and purifying us so that we might share in his holiness. Those who walk in darkness will enjoy the fleeting and deceiving delights of sin, but they will not know the ever-increasing pleasures of fellowship with God, who is light. There's no darkness in God, so for him to lovingly draw us closer to himself will involve many various disruptions and disappointments, but these chastisements prove his enduring commitment to our everlasting joy in his presence. Let me say it just as relationally and and simply as I can. If you're a Christian, God wants good for you. He wants you to enjoy his holiness. He wants you to enjoy the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And the only way that you can enjoy the peaceful fruit of righteousness, the only way that you can share in his holiness is through correction. It's through discipline. And in his great love, God would rather frustrate you and disappoint you and even bring about angry prayers. God would rather do that 
so that you can enjoy his holiness, that you can enjoy his peace, that you can enjoy fellowship with him. It is an incredibly uncomfortable thing to be disciplined by the Lord, and it isn't any fun seeing other people endure God's corrective love. But if he went to the cross so that sinners could be redeemed, then don't you think he has wise and effective means for using pain in our lives to bring about glorious good? Brother, sister, unless you're totally perfect, which you're not, then God is going to direct your steps by disrupting your plans and desires. But don't lose heart. God's word says it so clearly. It says it so quickly that even before I'm done with this paragraph, you might have the phrase memorized. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. Memorize that. Treasure it. Count on it. Don't give up. Discipline is hard, but the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Don't give up. Friend, if you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, but have somehow found yourself hearing this message, let me ask you a question. Are you angry with God because of the pain and trouble in your life? Are you pushing God away because his hand seems cruel? If that is the case, then let me ask you if you have considered the possibility that he's wiser than you. I don't mean to be snarky or rude, but have you considered the possibility that he knows more than you, that he's wiser than you, and that his love is greater than any love you've ever known? Have you considered that in his wisdom, perhaps his his rebukes, his restraints, and his repossessions are his efforts to direct your childish and wayward desires away from far more danger and depression than you've yet endured? You might be angry at God and thinking that he's just cruelly not letting you get what you want. But have you considered that he wisely is directing you from far worse things than you've even endured in this life? Have you considered the possibility that the one who has caused you so much trouble is the one who has loved you more than anyone has dared? Have you considered that possibility? Friends, all of this should lead us to the cross. And at the cross, we have our answer. At the cross, we know that God loves us more than anyone could ever love us. No one else went to a cross to save me for all of eternity. No one else has loved me and made sweet promises to me, and no one has been so faithful to me to discipline me day in and day out so that I I might not miss out on the great rewards of knowing him in his holiness. 